right. Hey, join us in our class this morning here, the Auditorium Bible Glass. We're going through the Baptist distinctives. Is that how important there is a name and what is in a name and what does that name mean and why are we Baptists and why do we, why do we believe what we believe and why we believe it. And so that's uh, what we're going through here. And so ha- good to have you with us this morning. Thanks for joining. More still coming in. We're just going to continue on. Little uh, background here, a little uh, back up a little bit, just an interview. All right, remember, we are fundamentalist. All right, what is that? It's a movement emphasizing the literal infallibility of the Bible. I think one of the things I'm going to start doing, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Brother, uh, uh, let's see, brother, brother, brother Pat, if he's with me on this. Uh, all these people constantly calling me, and when they do, and, and the first thing they want to know is, what do I believe? I'm going to start reversing that and say, well, tell me what you believe. I want to know what they believe. What, what page are they on? And they start talking like they're all out in left field, and I can know where to go with the conversation. But, uh, you know, I mean, it's just uh, um, amazing. And I said, well, we are Fundamental Independent Baptist Church. And if you look that up, you'll see and pretty much know where we're at and what we believe. But uh, then they start wanting to know if I'm Arminian in doctrine, if I'm Calvinist in doctrine, if I'm this or that. And sometimes you just want to, you know, I'm on the other end of the phone, good thing they can't see me. And uh, I'm thinking, you know, well, well, what are you? You know, are you an Arminian? Are you a Calvinist? Because if you are, we don't hold to that doctrine and teaching here. So, you know, that's as simple as that. All right, but anyway, we're fundamentalists. We believe the literal infallibility of the Bible. We're independent. We're self-governing ourselves, and we praise the Lord for that. And as we said last week in the church service, I said I would mention again in the Sunday School Hour, we hold to a literal translation of the Scripture. We take the Bible literally just as it says and what it is, except where it's speaking figuratively or symbolically, when there's a lot of symbolism in the book of Revelation, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And what you've got to do with that, you've got to let the Bible interpret the Bible. And if you'll keep reading long enough in there, it will tell you. It will it'll actually interpret itself. That's what I love about the Bible. It is the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. You won't find a better commentary. So we hold to those things, and so we learned about a name and how important a name is, what a name means. As again, I was driving around this week and Carol uh, Friday night, and uh, we see this church that says the Church of the Springs, and I go, okay, so what is that? You know, what do they believe? What's their doctrine? You know, you just you have no you, you have no clue uh, uh, of that, and so uh, that's why we have the name that we have. And it's what we believe, it's what we practice, at least I hope that's what we practice and, 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 and live, and I hope that's what we're living that, living up to our name. We ought to live up to our name, and I don't believe you need to be ashamed of your name, Baptists, because of our heritage, our roots, and the bloodline of Baptists. You ought to read the book. It's fantastic. I mean, it's fantastic. And uh, so forth, so... Uh, Real quick again, uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for today. God bless all those that are with us today, Father. What a beautiful day. This is a day the Lord has made, and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it, and we're thankful for it. And it's going to be a great day because you made it because you are a great and awesome God. And so we just want to thank you and praise you for all the blessings this week, for the protection in some of the severe storms that we had, and we thank you for that, and we praise you for that. We thank you for the rain. We thank you for the rain that's coming later today. And it looks like the next two or three days is going to be clear and sunny and beautiful. But thank you for clearing the air. Thank you for knocking all the pollen down into the ground and burying it. Amen to that for the allergies. And thank you for rescuing those two precious little dogs in our neighborhood. Father, praise the Lord. Amen. And uh, we thank you that this gentleman found his cow here this morning and hurdled hurled him up with a, a quarter horse. But it was a quarter horse that had four wheels called a John Deere. And so we thank you for that, and you get that cow back home where it belongs. And, oh Lord, we just want to thank you for today to worship you, give you praise and honor and glory. We ask for wisdom today, your Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide, and we'll give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, B stands for what, church? Stands for what? I can't hear you. Biblical authority. We believe the Bible is the inerrant, plenary, verbal, inspired Word of God. 
And we went through all of that last week. It's in your book there. Uh, you don't have the uh, inerrancy and the implerity and verbal as we went through the definitions of all of that last week. But we praise God for that. Amen. That's what we hold to. And so, and then so A, what does A stand for? Autonomy of the local church. We are autonomous, which means we govern ourselves. We are free agents. <laughs> and we govern ourselves as a church. We set up our own government, our standings, everything. No hierarchy, no dynasty, no board, no group or anything uh, governs the church. We are self-governing within ourselves. And so that's the autonomous of the local church. And, and so we appreciate that and we praise the Lord for that. Then we came to the word P, the letter P, B-A-P. P stood for what? The priesthood of the believer. You are a priest in Christ as a believer. The scripture's clear on that that says you are a priest. And we praise God for that. That's why the Bible tells us there is, a, uh, there is but one mediator. There is but how many? One, one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. That's the authority of biblical authority. So we believe that. And as priests, we have access to the throne of God. We do not have to go through a church. We do not have to go through a man, a priest, a dynasty, a border, anybody. We can go to God and approach His throne of grace, and we can ask for help and mercy in the time of need, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We don't have to, isn't that great? We can talk to God anytime we want to. We can study the Bible anytime we want to. We can read our own Bible. We don't have to be, uh, you know, the authority of the church that, that doesn't let us read the scriptures and then doesn't tell us what it is except for what they want to tell us what it is. We get to know what the Bible says by reading it. And so as priests, as priests, we get to do some of the priestly duties. What did priests do? They bless. You can bless one another. You can pray for one another. That's what a priest does. They intercede, you see. But as priests in Christ, you see, we get the privilege to intercede for each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. We don't have to go down to the church down here that has a different name on it and ask that person to intercede for you or for me. We can do it for each other right here, right now. Amen. We can pray for each other. We can teach each other the Bible. We can read to each other the Bible. We can bless one another. Why? Because we are priests in Christ. And God has made us priest, and we thank God for that. Jesus, of course, being our high priest, he's the chief priest, our high priest. We're a little priest under him, amen? And so it's great. And being priest, guess what? I don't have to wear a collar. I don't have to turn this shirt around backwards. Okay. I don't have to wear a shawl or cloth or a big cross hanging on my neck or a, a hundred beads hanging on my neck. You know, you don't have to do that. I, I'm a priest in Christ. Those things are man-made, they're rituals, they're ceremonial things, and most of it is false doctrine and teaching because it's based on man's teaching or the hierarchy or the dynasty of that particular religion and so forth. So we're priests. In the Old Testament, we had priests. Pick up a little bit where we were at. We had the Leviticus. We had the priest had no blemish. This is some of their qualifications. They had to have proof of genealogy. Uh, they had to wear special garments. This is the Old Testament. They had to be purified by the blood. And so you can compare that to 1 Peter, Exodus and 1 Peter. When we come to the New Testament, almost the same thing. In the New Testament in Ephesians, they're to have no blemish. That's the priest. That's us. John says we're to have proof of genealogy. I love that. I'm going to preach a message on this one of these days. I keep saying that, but I've got to work it up and get it together. On the DNA. Huh? What's in your DNA? Amen. Okay. And, then, and, and that's in Ephesians. Our genealogy is found in Romans and Ephesians. Uh, Revelation. Uh, we have special garments as priests. And that is the garments we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. All right, are you with me? There's my garment. I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ, and one day I'm going to get a white robe of righteousness that I'm going to wear in, in glory. And I hope the Lord has multicolors and different colors, and we get some change. You know, you've got to have a wardrobe and have a little change. But I'll leave that up to him. Whatever it'll be, it'll be fantastic. Maybe when we go in different spots and areas of the light, we'll change colors. Amen? Or maybe it'll be like a rainbow, that's the particles of dust that are mixed with moisture, and then they're illuminated by the sunlight of the rays of the sunlight, and we get a beautiful rainbow. Now, if you tell that to somebody that's born blind, they, 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 don't, they can't understand that. They can't comprehend that. They can't comp the beauty of that, you see, because they can't experience the beauty of it because they can't see it. 
And uh, I'll stay off my message for this morning, all right? All right, then the entrance is made possible. Okay, well, how is entrance made possible? Matthew tells us that the veil was written to. When the veil was written to, we had access to God. And you know all that took place the time that the high priest was cutting the throat of the lamb and sacrificing the lamb on the altar was the same time they crucified Jesus on the cross and it is finished and the veil split and rent in two, making heaven an access for you and I into the throne of God. Uh, the partition was broken down, okay, and access was made possible for you and I to approach the throne of grace. Some key verses there we have, and Peter tells us we're a royal priesthood. Revelation says we are kings and priests. Hebrew says we can come boldly before the throne of grace and ask for help and mercy in the time of need. Uh, Hebrew says we enter into that through the blood of Christ. Not the blood of a lamb, but the blood of Christ, okay? We're to offer spiritual sacrifices unto the Lord, according to 1 Peter 2.5. And then 1 Timothy 2.16 says we can intercede for everyone. That great intercessory prayer. And so that's the priesthood of the believer. Well, what's the next word in Baptist? B A P T. Oh, and there are two T's and two S's. So we're going to go to the T, and there are two T's. It doesn't matter what order they're in, but I'm going to give it to you in this order. All right, I think it's in your notebook there. All right, and that is the first is the two ordinances. All right, we're going to look at the two ordinances. Do you have that, two ordinances? Okay, we're good, all right. All right, the two ordinances. We've, and again, now remember, our belief says Baptist is based on Scripture. All of it is derived from the Scripture, where we get this from. It's not from any other books or any other writings or any other denomination or leadership or anything else. It comes straight out of the Bible. And so there are two ordinances that the New Testament is clear on that you and I as believers are to participate in. And that is the ordinance of baptism and the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. It's the only two ordinances in, in, in the church. Now folks, when other denominations or other religions tell you there are three or four, mark it down, that's false, that's not true. That's not biblical. Now that may be true in their dynasty or in their headquarters or in their operational uh, system or you know whatever that they have um, drummed up and made up and so forth, and that's fine. But we're going by biblical authority. See, we have to go back to the first letter in our name, the biblical authority, thus saith the Lord. And it's the final authority. And so based on that, there are two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper which we observed a few weeks ago at uh, Palm Sunday, we observed the Lord's Supper. Last week, we observed baptism. All right, we're going to present her baptismal tour today. All right, and so that, that's the two ordinances. Now, there are other churches, even Baptist churches, that have a third one called feet washing, foot washing. That's not an ordinance in the church. Jesus did not sanctify, sanctify that or set that up as an ordinance, nor ordained it. It was just something that uh, when, when Jesus washed the, the feet of the disciples, he was not setting up an ordinance and something that we were to do in practice. It was all about servitude and, and, and serving one another. And he came to serve, not to be ministered to, but to minister and to serve. He took on the form of a servant and fashioned himself in the order of a man, in the likeness of man. And so he was showing that even he, the Son of God, by the way, God himself, got down on his hands and knees and washed the dirty feet of the disciples there and dried them and showing an act of service, teaching them that you're going to serve one another and serve everybody from here on out. See, the, the ministry is about serving. It's not about us. It's not about who we are or what we are. It's about sacrificing our time, talent, and treasure for the kingdom of God to minister to people because the church is people and people are the church. And that's the ministry. Now, I like my friend, uh, Brother Mike, you know, and, and I'm with him sometimes when things are really going, uh, you know, not so well in the church and you've got problems and so forth. I like what Mike will say, Michael will call and say, oh, Pastor, it, church would be great if it wasn't for people. And, and I say, amen, Mike. <laughs> and I say, okay, brother, what are you going through? <laughs> and so, but no, people are ministry, ministry people. So we have the two ordinances. So when we talk about baptism uh, for a little bit, Believer's baptism, we call it. It is the first act of obedience to Christ after a person is saved and comes to know Christ. 
You do not get baptized before your salvation. Not a lot of people did, and she did. That's why she wanted to make it right and do it right. She was baptized a long time ago. She came to me, and she was just saved two years ago. And she said, so I want to make it right. I want to have believer's baptism after my salvation. And, and, and that's what we do. And, and baptism, believe it or not, biblical scriptural baptism is only for those who are saved. Only for those who have trusted in Christ, believed in Him. Any other baptism other than, that's not of that is false and, and, and erroneous teaching and doctrine. It's an error. It's not scriptural or biblical. Now, don't get mad at me. And, and, and you, remember, where are we going back to? Biblical authority. The first letter of, of the Baptist. And, 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 and we base it on biblical authority in the Scripture. And uh, that's why we do not infant baptize. Infant baptism is wrong. It's erroneous. It's a false doctrine. It was derived from a dynasty and a particular denomination in faith that you are f for very familiar with, and a lot of others follow that. And the problem with that, that is so dangerous because that teaches those little ones as they grow up to keep are told they're baptized, they're baptized, they're saved, they're members of the mother church, and so you're okay and you're going to heaven. No, folks, that's false. That's false doctrine and teaching. Matter of fact, if you start telling kids that and they grow up thinking that, that is damnable heresy according to biblical authority. Now, no, 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 don't get mad at me. I mean, no, and don't get mad at me. I, I'm just here to tell you the truth. And the truth that I tell you and share with you is straight from biblical authority. And so if you have a problem with it and argue with it, take it up with God. But I can assure you, you can hire the finest of lawyers, you won't win. You know why? Because it was settled in the heavens before eternity passed. It's been put in the furnace of silver and tried seven times and come out as pure. And God says, my word will stand and abide forever, forever, and forever. So it's based on the authority of scripture. Now, so don't get mad at me. So we don't baptize, that's why way back in the early days, way back, I mean way back, we had what we call the Anabaptist. And, and, and many of them lost their lives and were martyred for that belief that they, would, they refused under the church and a state church, which was a Roman Catholic church. They refused to do so and they were put to the stakes, they were put to the fire, they, they, they were martyred and everything because they took a stand on biblical truth and they would refuse to baptize infants. So we do not believe in infant baptism. It's not, matter of fact, you won't find it anywhere in the scripture. So if it's not in the Bible, then it's not of God. Okay? And it's a symbol. It's an outward expression. It's a picture of what has taken place inward in the life of a person. They stand in the baptismal waters and they identify with Christ in his death. They have died with Christ. That's what Paul said, nevertheless, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, that I live, but Christ liveth in me. In the life that I now live by the flesh, you understand that passage? You've been crucified with Christ. You're buried in that watery grave. You identify in his death, and you're raised to walk in newness of life. Or you're raised, well, our pastor, back when I was baptized as a kid, he, there, we were raised in the glorious likeness of his resurrection. So, yeah, I don't care which way you say it. Doesn't matter to me. You're going to be raised up. You're raised up. And it's an outward public testimony to the congregation that I have accepted Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, and I've trusted Him and Him only, and that I am not trusting in these waters. Come on, talk to me, church, that there's nothing holy about the water up there. And if you want to go get in it this morning, it's cold. About 42 degrees. So you can go wake up real quick. Okay, there's nothing holy about it, nothing sanctified about it. Came out of a 200-foot well out here. Okay, it doesn't wash away sin. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can wash away sin. Matter of fact, our brother Peter says that we get baptized not for the washing away of the filth of the flesh, but of a good conscience towards God. So baptism, it's a picture, it's a symbol. It's after salvation. A lot of people have been baptized, and, and they think that, that now that that has made them right with God, 
uh, they feel like that they're going to heaven now because there are those churches that teach that. Folks, you can get baptized 100 times in 20 different churches if you want. And, and it's not going to get you salvation. It's not going to get you into an entrance into heaven. The only thing that's going to get you into heaven is a personal relationship of faith and trust in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross of Calvary, and that's it, period. Otherwise, you're not going. You're going to miss the train or the plane, or for me, I'll miss the chariot, but I'm not missing the chariot. We were going home, what was it, Sunday and Wednesday night? Yeah, after church, that storm came through here. Oh, my. We were driving down towards uh, our famous pizza place. Man, the lightning was, bolts were went over here. Boom. Uh, man, it was wide as all get out. And I said, look at this. Wow, God's given us a light show tonight. And I told, okay, now, Lord, let's listen now. If, if, if this is it, then uh, that, that bolt of lightning's got to hit this car and turn it into a chariot of fire. <laughs> and then Carol can go with me at the same time in the chariot of fire. Give her a real trip. You know what I mean? Amen. Here's another thing that's incorrect in a lot of churches in doctrine. We don't baptize infants, we don't sprinkle, and we don't pour. That's erroneous doctrine. That's not biblical, it's not, it's not in the Bible. Again, we go back to biblical authority. The word baptizo in the Greek means to immerse. It means to place one under. To immerse, to submerge. I was asking Veronica, I said, how long can you tread water this morning? She goes, not too long. I said, okay, we'll get you up and crook. Otherwise, I said, I'm just going to put my head down on top of your forehead there and kind of hold you and, 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 and preach a little three-point message here real quick, maybe 15, 20 minutes, and we'll be done. Can you, can you hold water that long? She goes, no, I don't think so. I said, okay, uh, how about uh, five seconds? Oh, yeah, I can do that. I said, okay, great. So I put her down. I looked. A few bubbles came out. Bloop, bloop. I said, she's ready. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and so praise the Lord. So we don't sprinkle. We don't pour. We don't baptize infants. How are you going to? Be? And we were baptizing in Africa after a, a week crusade, and we had won a lot of people to Christ. And all week long, we've been teaching uh, uh, about baptism and and teaching how. We had two classes. One class was on how to give your testimony now that you're saved, and, you know, and share Christ. And then the other was on baptism, why, how, and all this kind of stuff. And then at the end of the week, we would have a baptismal service. And it would either be in the lake or the river, whatever. I love the, the river. I, some of the, the rivers, the clear ones. I didn't love the dark ones. And, and some of the ponds are a little bit spooky. You know, but uh, we have it. And I got ready to baptize this girl. And, and all immediately, I mean, before she even gave me a chance, she goes, whoa. I said, no, 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 wrong way, wrong way. We don't bury you face down. We bury you. <laughs> we come up, okay, you see, we're going to rise. We're going to have a resurrection here. You're not going to go, we're not going to bury you face down. And so, uh, it's, uh, you know, hey, you know what? The kids loved it. They got baptized when we were in the river, especially in the, in the villages. Man, they'd take off swimming. And I'd tell them, hey, wait till this is all over, and I'll join you. And we did. I mean, we just had a great time, and we praised God. So, you know, that, that's baptism. And, uh, and, and another thing about scriptural, biblical baptism, we refute, we totally refute baptismal regeneration Amen. as Baptists. We do not believe in baptismal regeneration. It does not wash away the filth of the flesh. It does not wash away your sins. Now, the Church of Christ, that's one of their doctrines. You, you, you get baptized to wash away your sins and for salvation and all of that stuff. And that is not biblical or scriptural. Okay? We don't believe in baptismal regeneration. And that's what some believe in. And they take one verse out of here uh, and pull it out of content and, and out of and context and say, see, there it is. But there's way too much stronger teaching against that, that we do not believe in that. Okay, in other words, the act of water, church, is not a symbol or a necessary for salvation. Water has nothing to do with salvation. You understand that? It's not a, re it's not a requirement to be saved. But that's where some teach and believe. And again, where does our teaching and belief come when it comes to BAPT, two ordinances, baptism, from the biblical authority? We have to go back to what does the Bible teach. And we go back to biblical authority. So that's one. Then, of course, we have what is called the Lord's Supper. 
Amen. And then we have our Baptist review. And I have a lot of scriptures here. A lot of it on, on, on our, how we feel about that and what we think about that. And then, of course, then there is the Lord's Supper. Everybody familiar with the Lord's Supper? Okay, again, the Lord's Supper does not save you. Matter of fact, here we go again, back to biblical authority. The Lord's Supper is only for believers. It is only for those who have been saved and washed in the blood of the Lamb and have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That is scriptural backing of the authority of the Bible is the Lord's Supper. It's not for everybody. It's for only believers. You must be a born-again believer and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You're a part of the body of Christ through that salvation experience, and you are eligible at that time in, in order to participate and take a partake of the Lord's Supper. Jesus instituted it the night before his betrayal on the cross. This was the Lord's Supper. This is the new covenant in my blood. who are no longer under the old covenant of the Old Testament. You're now under the new covenant in my blood is the new covenant. Not the blood of lambs and sacrifices of animals. I'm the final sacrifice on the cross, and we have a new blood covenant. And we participate in the Lord's Supper. And we have two... Um, materials that we use it's symbolic the cup representing the juice which we use juice and we use that and and we use bread and we use unleavened bread which is a picture of christ's broken body not that his bones were broken but he was broken in spirit and heart for us and for our salvation and he said this is my body jesus said which is broken for you take eat and do this in remembrance of me and as often as you do this in remembrance of me, you do show forth my death till I come. The Lord's Supper is to look back at the cross, to remind us of what Jesus did for us on Calvary, and then it's to look forward to his coming again. The juice represents the blood of Christ that was shed on the cross for our, as a matter of fact, the Lord's Supper has nothing to do with salvation. It is not the sacraments that's not going to bring you salvation. Okay, you've already had salvation. You do not eat the body of Christ and you do not drink the blood of Jesus. Okay, first of all, we're not cannibals, so that wouldn't happen. And, let me, and here's another good one too. And I, I thought about this past week and did a little reading on this and just giving some thought to it. A lot of times when it comes to Scripture, looking at Scripture, you can look up Greek words and, and so forth and, 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 and really get into it deep, and you can't. And, but there are going to be those of this and that and so forth. Uh, but, with, uh, you know, wine. Some of the, a lot of churches use wine for the Lord's Supper. We as Baptists use grape juice. Matter of fact, we use Welch's, 100% grape juice. It's very good for your tummy if you have a stomach problem. But I got to thinking about it. Jesus' blood was pure and holy and righteous. Would you agree? Say amen. amen. Okay. He would not want for us to, to, to eat leavened bread because a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Leaven represents sin and corruption. Now, in order to drink wine for the Lord's Supper, real wine would have to be fermented. Therefore, it becomes contaminated Come on, church, talk with, you know, talk with me here a little bit. So that is, again, why we do not use real wine for the Lord's Supper, because real wine, I don't care if it's got 3%, 4% alcohol, I'm not worried about that. In order for it to ferment, it has to ferment to become real wine, and that's a contamination that takes place, actually, in the fermentation, and therefore we do not want to take anything that would be contaminated and so forth so just that's something for you to throw about something for you to think about and something for you to go and study on your own so praise the lord amen so i'm not going to argue with that on you we could get into that and have a big long discussion forever okay and so we're not going to do that so the two ordinances as baptists we believe there are but two that is the lord's supper and baptism 
And that's what we go by, what we believe, and what we teach. There's a little bit of explaining baptism to you. There's a little bit of explaining of the Lord's Supper to you. It's a symbolic of his death, burial, and his resurrection, of what he did for us on the cross. And he said, I want you to do this as often. Now, he didn't say do it often, as often, as you do this in remembrance of me. Now, some want to do it every week. Well, we don't have to do it every week. Some do it every month. We don't have to do it every month. Some do it every quarter. We don't have to do it every quarter. I mean, we try to do it every quarter. Every three months, we try to have the Lord's Supper so we can have four times a year and do that. Now, the Scripture doesn't give us a specific time order and so forth, or you, need, you have to do this 10 times, you have to do this 12 times, you have to do all that. Because you start getting into that, you start getting into rituals and, and so forth and ceremonials and things like that. So we want to be careful. And you have Scripture there on it. So when we get to the priest, we're P, B-A-P-T, two ordinance. What's next? Ah, what is I? Individual soul liberty. Individual soul liberty. Okay, what does that mean? Well, I gave you a little definition there of it. Let's take a look at it, what it says here. All right. Every individual, believer and unbeliever, possesses the God-given privilege of free will. The free will of man. Hello. Now we're not going to get into election here, okay? But everybody has a free will, having the liberty to choose what, and I didn't put it in here in this sentence, but I probably should have, to choose what or who you will believe. No one should be forced to any belief against his or her will. God speaks to individuals through his word and his spirit. Now we'll touch on dreams tonight, but we'll get more into dreams next week. Okay, with Joseph. See, I got all this going on in my head, man. And you, you gotta, I, gotta, I gotta keep three messages straight today and separate them from here in the morning and tonight. And so uh, all of it pops up in your head as you're moving through it. So uh, individuals through his word and his spirit, every person is an individual, individually responsible to God and will be judged according to the beliefs and practices he or she freely chooses. Freedom of choice demands personal responsibility, and I should have added there as well, and accountability. So you might want to put that down in your notes there. You could put in there to, uh, uh, of what to believe and, and who to believe, right in there a little bit over there. I'll put that in there for you. I didn't put it in. Sorry about that. And not only are you going to have personal responsibility, but church, you have a personal accountability. Paul made that very clear in Romans and Corinthians that every one of us as a believer now, as a believer, will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account. There's that accountability of what we have done in our body, whether good or bad. The Scripture tells us we're going to give an account of every idle word that's come out of your mouth. Uh-oh, we better all go run and hide, amen? Because how many idle words have come out of our mouths? We're going to give an account for every thought. That's the one that scares me the most. Every thought. There's accountability. And here's the choice. You get to choose which judgment you go to. You can choose to go to the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat, by becoming a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and receiving him as your Lord and Savior. But if you do not do that, then you have chose, whether you want to agree with it or not, you have made a decision. See, when you say no to Christ, you made a decision. When you say yes to Christ, you've made a decision. When you say, well, I'm not sure or I don't know, you've made a decision, and that's a no decision. But you'll also stand before the great white throne judgment of God Almighty in the end, and that's a choice. You choose not to receive Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, and by faith trust in him. The Bible makes it clear that when you die, you will spend an eternity in a place called hell, but that you will be resurrected at the end times, and you will stand before the great white throne, a judgment of God Almighty, only to be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, which burneth forever and forever for all eternity. And the choice is yours. Yes. 
I want you to be praying for those families. Just came to my mind, those five that were executed in Texas yesterday. Someone broke into a home with, of course, one of the weapons that everybody's against and wants to ban, and executed five people in their home. Execution style. As of yesterday afternoon, he was still on the run. And I thought, Lord, were those people saved or lost? They weren't planning that that day. They weren't thinking about that day. Had no idea that was going to happen that day. But were they ready? Were they ready to meet God? Were they ready to step out into eternity? Even though they died a horrible, violent death. But were they ready? I was driving home yesterday, or no, I don't know about yesterday. I was driving the neighborhood and thinking about some things, and I said, Lord, look at all these people here. I said, you know, if they're not saved, they're going to spend an eternity in a lake of fire forever, forever, forever. And I said, oh God, thank you that somebody told me about Jesus. And I said, yes, and I'm saved, and I'm born again, and I'm ready. Should something happen, I don't have to worry where I'm going to spend eternity. I smiled at that and rejoiced, but at the same time I thought about, what about all these precious souls that don't know Jesus. Hell is real, people. And people will spend an eternity there separated from God for all eternity if we don't get the gospel message out. So, individual soul liberty. He that believeth on the Son, who's he? Say, that's me. Hath ever, no, who's he? No, no. He that believeth. Jesus doesn't believe on himself. He that believeth on the Son. Who's that? All right, that says that's me, that's you. What's the result if you believe on the Son? You have everlasting life. Now look at the other side of the coin. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And if you go on and read in John there, you'll already see, you'll, you'll also see in the other verses there uh, that the wrath of God already is on that person that doesn't believe. You can read Romans 14, 4 through 12 there. It's good for you. We'll drop down to 2 Corinthians. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in the craftiness or handling the word of God deceitfully, but manifestation, being known, making real, being re- revealed, of the truth condemning ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Titus 1, 9 says, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able to buy what? Not just doctrine, sound doctrine, both exhort and to convince the gangsayers. So we have soul liberty, and it's a wonderful that we have that freedom of choice. I'm glad that Jesus didn't just die for the elect. Amen. I'm glad that the love of God is for every person. Jesus doesn't love Pat more than me, and he doesn't love me more than Pat. Jesus doesn't love Pat more than George, or George more than, we're all loved by the same equal love of God, and there's not anything you and I can do that's gonna change that in one way or the other. He's not gonna love him any less, or me any less, or you any less, or anybody else less. It's the love of God, and thank God for it. Well, praise the Lord, we've looked at I, what's the next one? S, all right, we come to S, and we're gonna pick up S next week, as we look at S. So what do we have? We have B is what? Biblical, Biblical authority. A, autonomy, autonomous of the church. P, the priesthood. I, 
T, T, sorry, T. T, the fourth letter. T, two ordinances. What are the two ordinances? The Lord's Supper. Then I, individual soul liberty. Everyone has the freedom of choice. It's the free will of man. God gave you and I a free will to choose. And so I pray that you'll use and exercise your free will to serve Christ, to live for him, to honor him, to obey him in all areas of our lives. And we thank the Lord for that. So next week we're going to pick up with what letters? S, S, T, and S. Not going to do a lot of reviewing, so we're going to finish up the last three. Next week, Lord willing, we'll see uh, if that's what he has in store for us. And we'll check out the last three. Then you're going to have, a, a, I think, a good understanding of Baptists, why we're Baptists, our name, what it means, why we believe it, and all based on biblical authority. These Baptist distinctives are derived from the Scriptures. Thank you.